What's up, guys? This is Mr. O'Brien. Uh, we're, today, we're going to talk about quantum theory and the atom. Uh, this is unit uh, 1D, um, part 1, and this is for both college prep and honors. So let's get started. So we're going to talk about the Bohr model. Uh, the Bohr model picture here on the right-hand side, um, essentially, it's like this planetary idea of a, what the model, what the atom looks like with the electrons in it. Now, I want to make sure, give a little disclaimer here. This is not the appropriate picture as we know of what an atom looks like, especially the electrons. Um, it's a more complex idea, yet we uh, teach the Bohr model because it helps simplify an understanding of what we commonly uh, see, such as color, which we'll eventually get to. So that's my little disclaimer there. So let's get started, right? Um, so what does this quantum theory describe? We, I'm sure you've heard of this term before, quantum theory, like uh, quantum mechanics. Um, there's a lot of movies that use that fancy term. And the word quantum theory really just describes um, matter that can gain or lose energy in small, specific amounts. So take a look at this picture, right? Uh, stairs versus a ramp. We call the stairs quantized value because, as you can see, the steps or at specific distances away from each other. Whereas here, there is no specific set distances away. This just is a ramp, right? Energy in nature is always quantized, right? It always exists as specific bundles or packets or distances away from each other. Nature has this, this point of organizing things. So how is quantum theory then applied when we're describing the atom, right? So this Bohr model attempts to describe the specific amounts of energy electrons carry as they move around the nucleus. Now imagine in this Bohr model, right, um, there are each of these little levels, right, essentially are these little orbits where electrons move around, right? And I, again, this is not the real picture of the atom, but it's a good starting point to understand some phenomenon. So as they move around the nucleus, at very fast speeds, they carry with them some energy. Now, these electrons orbit at specific distances away from that nucleus, as you can see in this example. Those specific distances away essentially is the quantum idea of the atom. Um, these, are, these orbits, as we call them, are also identified as energy levels because, again, the further you are from that nucleus, the more energy you possess, the electrons possess. Now, imagine this example here of, of the stadium seating. You notice that every seat in the theater is a specific distance away from each other. And more so, if you notice that as you go beyond the theater, right, further up, you'll notice that more seats are present, right? Consider these questions. What do you notice about the orbital size in this picture? How does the size of the orbital affect the electrons that orbit the nucleus? Consider these two questions and think about the pictures uh, of the quantum that are presented to you. How are electrons then distributed among the orbitals? So it's an important term that we need to understand here is a valence electron, which we'll hit up in a moment. This is an example of the Bohr model for carbon. If you can imagine, take a moment and pause if you see if you can figure out how are these six electrons for carbon essentially ordered in this way. Take a look and see if you can figure it out based on the periodic table. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you. So the periodic table is divided up into seven energy levels. These seven orbits are essentially related to where the element exists on that periodic table. The electrons in the atom are placed according to where they sit on the periodic table. So in carbon, there's essentially, two, uh, it sits on the second row. So hence, we give it the two orbitals, right? Well, then what's the, what's the difference then for the, um, so what's the difference for then um, the electrons? How do we know? Well, in the first shell here, right, there's one, and then there's two. These two are placed in the first row, right? There they are at right there. But then we continue on counting. So this is lithium, beryllium, boron, and then carbon. So these four on the second row sit in the second orbital of the, of the atom. 
Now, you see different colors here. It's because these blue ones essentially are, are kind of showing you that they come from this area right here, right? And these green ones show you that they're coming from this area right here, right? These two. And, and again, the green and the blue doesn't really matter when we draw the Bohr model. The point is housing the number of electrons, right? And as you can see in the previous slide, I asked you that question. What do you notice about the orbitals and the electrons? You can see that the orbitals get bigger as you draw them, and you can fit more electrons further away from the nucleus. So are all electrons in the atom equally important? No way. The valence electrons are the most important. Whoa, are the most important uh, atoms on the periodic on that element, and and for a reason we'll eventually cover later on. Okay, so the point that I need you to understand here is that whoa, sorry, is that these are the these guys right here are the valence electrons, and as you can see, uh, carbon's got four valence electrons. Right. Let's move on. Let's try to draw this, right? So here's an example of the basic one for sulfur. Okay, so we're going to draw sulfur. So the first thing that you need to recognize is where sulfur sits on the periodic table. So sulfur sits on this third row. So because it sits on this third, third row, I'm going to draw three orbitals, three shells, right? Three energy levels. So once you have three energy levels, the question is, sulfur's got 16 protons, and it also has 16 electrons. Where do we put these 16 electrons? Well, again, we're going to uh, find out where the sulfur sits on that periodic table and go by uh, atomic number order. So these first two right electrons go in the first shell, which is placed right there. The second, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, these guys in orange will be placed in row two, the second shell. Now, again... You'll see that there are different colors here. These two, these two, these two. That's those six. Those six come from here, this one gap, right? And then these blue ones come from this gap right here. All together, it doesn't matter the colors. What we're looking at is that there's eight electrons in that second shell, as you can count. Now we're on that third shell. That third shell is identified uh, as also uh, these two are placed here. Right, and one, two, three, four. So there's a total of six electrons in that last shell. Two, four, and then six. Now again, these green ones, one, two, three, four, come from here, the yellow section here. And again, it doesn't matter the color. We're just the most important piece is identifying the number of electrons that go in the in the shell. So we have again six electrons in the valence shell that last shell, we have eight valence electrons here. We finally have two valence electrons there. When we add this up, that's 10. 10 plus 6 is 16. 16 is given to you up here, right? Okay, so try this on. Uh, try this basic example for the Bohr model for calcium. See if you can figure that out. Well, then there's more uh, challenging ones, like the elements in the transition metals. Now, you might not know what transition metals are, but that's okay because that's what we're here for. So the transition metals are this middle section of the periodic table. Notice the color is slightly different here, right? Because what happens with the transition metals is that these guys like to hide valence electrons, right? You might, you might think, hey, man, there's going to be a bunch of electrons on that four shell. But what we end up finding out is that these guys hide electrons. Now, if you don't, if you don't like that figure, idea of hiding electrons... Consider that the third shell is still has room to fill versus the second shell, right? So nature has, an, has this ability to order, right, electrons. So let's get started on how we do this one. So in the first thing, uh, electrons, right, these first two here, we're going to, again, count by the atomic number. So these two here are going to go in that first shell, as seen here. Remember, based on this lecture notes, the, the colors identify where they're coming from, and not that you need to write colors, okay? In the second shell, we're going to identify these two six boxes, so a total of eight boxes go in that second shell. So here you have two, four, six, and then eight, right? Again, those eight come from that second shell. Then we're going to go in order, right, on the third shell. So in that third shell, we have uh, sodium, 
right? Uh, sodium, magnesium, all the way through argon. Those eight electrons are placed here. Again, these two um, in blue are from that middle, from this last section right here, that first section. And then these green ones right here are from that um, this section right here, this yellow section, right? So there's six green ones, right? Six boxes, right? So, so far we have eight electrons. We continue on for on the four shell. Now those four shell, right, go out here on the top, right? There you have it. These blue ones are, again, from these two guys. But we're not done yet because cobalt sits in that middle section, that transition element, the seventh box in that in this funky section. So how, how do we identify where these electrons go? Well, remember, they hide their electrons. And because they hide their electrons, we're going to place them not in the fourth shell, the valence shell. We're going to place them one below it. So these red ones here, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These seven coincide with the seven boxes that you see there. Altogether, what's most important here is that, on average, on the idea here is that cobalt has two valence electrons because the seven that it you see on the periodic table hides. Now, again, if you want to know why it hides, we'll consider that the third shell is way bigger than the second shell, so we'll fit more electrons in it. Uh, try this next problem for zinc, and if you have a hard time with this, hit me up in the tutorial. All right. Let's continue on with this last idea of trying to draw another challenging uh, Bohr model. In this case, we're going to draw the Bohr model for bromine. This, the same idea happens, right? So we're going to identify the number of orbitals in bromine. We find that bromine sits on the fourth row. So because it sits on the fourth row, we're going to draw four shells. One, two, three, four. But how do we organize all of the 35 electrons for bromine? Same idea. Let's go ahead and count in, alpha, in, in atomic number order the electrons. So in the first one, we have those two. Again, the blue ones indicate these guys down here. Not that the colors matter. Then the second shell, right, we're going to place these eight electrons. Here are your eight. Two, right, four, six, eight. Okay? In the third shell, we're going in order. These two and these six are placed here. Two, four, six, eight. Remember that the color green is associated, based on this picture, with these six. Then we're going to go into the next row. And so remember that these two guys sit on the fourth shell, right? So there's your two from potassium and calcium. But what do we do with these guys? Do you recall? Yes, we hide the electrons. So those guys right there, we have to hide the electrons, and they're identified in red. So we were just in the fourth shell. We're going to hide these now in the third shell. So there's two, four, six, eight, ten. Those ten electrons are hidden. Now we're getting to that second tower here. These electrons don't hide anymore. These one, two, three, four, and five electrons are placed back up into row uh, four, right back into the valence shell. And again, they're identified here as green. So you got one, two, three, four, five. And so all together in that last shell, the most important is that you have seven valence electrons. All right? Now, um, try that. Try that at a similar problem here. And if you're having a hard time with indium, hit me up at tutorial and I can help you out there. So the last idea here, right, about electron dot structures. So the valence electrons are extremely important in an atom, extremely, right? So is there a shortcut to find the valence electrons? Because the Bohr model helps us identify or explain a phenomenon that not yet is covered here. We'll do it in a lab. Um, but the most important idea is those valence electrons. So yes, there is an idea, right? Um, it's essentially the towers. In group one or period, in group one or column one, Every single element, no matter what the number of shells it has, will always have one valence electron. The second one will always have two valence electrons. Again, no matter the amount of shells. And then 13, or sometimes they call it 3A, will always have three. And 14 will have four. 
15 will have 5, and 16 will have 6, 17 will have 7, and then 18 will have 8. With the exception of helium, right? Because helium has a only one shell, so it can only fit two electrons, right? So again, um, it's important that we identify and we recognize this shortcut for drawing uh, for identifying number of valence electrons. So why are these valence electrons important? When we get to the unit of bonding, you're going to have to understand a little bit about the dots and how they exchange or change when combined with other elements. So these atoms will bond to form molecules like water, groups of atoms, right? Or in this case here, like methane gas. You see methane gas and gas is powered, you know, buses and things like that, cars, right? Natural gas cars. Um, the shells are different, right? Carbon is a way bigger atom than hydrogen because it's got two shells, and you can see it here. But what's more important about the atom is not so much how big it is, right? But it's valence electrons, right? And carbon has got four valence electrons because it sits on the four shell, right? And those four valence electrons are present there. Hydrogen has only one valence electron, right? And so the one valence electron is present there. Now, we're not going to cover... Uh, right now how this works, but it's really critical that you can recognize the number of valence electrons without drawing the Bohr model for carbon, right, and for hydrogen, and for any other element uh, for that in that matter. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can practice some of these examples of um, Lewis dot, little electron dot structure. So here's aluminum. So if you were to draw aluminum on the, on the periodic table, right, find it, you would find that aluminum is on the third row, third shell is right here, right? I'm sorry, it's a little off. I've got to fix that. Now, again, we really don't care about the all the electrons. What only matters is the valence, and the valence electrons for aluminum is three. But you didn't have to draw the Bohr model to know that because you can see that if uh, aluminum sits on the third column, third big column on the periodic table, so because of that, we identify it with three dots, right? So there you have it. Now, one rule that I like to identify for drawing electron dot structures, at least in this class, is that you got to make sure that if an, uh, an element has more than, say, you know, two electrons, like in this case, aluminum, you can only fit uh, two, you can only draw a maximum of two electrons per side. So you can't do, you can't have something like that. that that's not of an appropriate format. Right, so we don't want to do that. Okay, uh, another format that's this works is this. This works too. Right, one, two, three. But they, you can't have more than two dots per side. That's the only trick. All right. So try these problems out, and if you have any um, need any help, hit me up at tutorial. All right. Good luck.